Hi everyone, so today we're going to talk about something called as Roots of Unity and Diophantines. So, you know, Diophantine equation is a very fascinating concept and uh, many times we employ a lot of, you know, different problem solving tools in order to solve that. One of them is complex numbers. Now, the question involving complex numbers and Diophantine are relatively fewer, but when they do arrive, it's actually a very fascinating question. And this is one such question in which we're going to have to use a little bit of knowledge about Roots of Unity and complex numbers in order to solve a particular Diophantine number theory question. So without wasting any time, let's just get right into this. So this is the problem number three from the Irish Math Olympiad in the year 2009. And in this video, we're going to be looking at what the nth roots of unity are and its properties. I'm going to list down a couple of properties which we are going to use for this question. Then we're also going to see how we can use complex numbers to factorize and solve Diophantines, right? Then you have said book sessions in National Math Olympiads and at the end, a similar but tragic problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, computer science and informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so we need to find all natural numbers n for which n raised to the power 8 plus n plus 1 is a prime. So effectively, we just need to solve the Diophantine n raised to the power 8 plus n plus 1. Now this is a prime p, right? Now, um, there are a few ways to do this. So the intuition behind this is um, n raised to the power 8 plus n plus 1. If, it, if I can basically you know, factor this out into two distinct terms, let's say a and b, you know, whatever they might be, um, then it will never be a prime, right? And obviously, if this both are greater than one, right? So if I am able to factorize this into, you know, two distinct polynomials, such that both of them are greater than one, then this thing n raised to the power 8 plus n plus 1 will never be a prime, right? So that is kind of what will drive a lot of the work that I'm going to do to solve this question. So that would be great, right? If you could just be able to factorize this n to the power 8 plus n plus 1, that would be amazing. But if you actually notice that from rational root theorem, n to the power 8 plus n plus 1 really doesn't have any, uh, has zero rational roots. Right? Because from rational root theorem, the only possible rational root it can have is 1 and minus 1, and you can really see that it does not work for either of them. So it has zero rational roots, or it has zero real roots as well to be very honest. So the way to figure this out would be using complex numbers because the factorization for this does exist, but finding out its factor pairs is what we're going to use complex numbers for, right? And to do that, we're going to have to use a concept called the roots of unity. So for example, if I say third root of unity, right? Just Let's just say that third root of unity. What does that mean? That means I need to find a number x such that x cube is equal to 1. So unity is 1, obviously, and, uh, and third root of unity will be cube root of 1, or in other words, x cube is equal to 1. And x cube is equal to 1, notice that this is a cubic equation, so it will have three roots, obviously. So I can just bring 1 to the other side, this becomes like this, and I can just factorize this as x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to 0. Now, let omega be a third root, third root of unity or of one basically so that implies that omega minus one is equal to zero and therefore omega is equal to one or omega squared plus omega plus one is equal to zero essentially what i'm talking about is um either this is zero right so omega minus one is zero omega is equal to one or this thing is zero right so omega squared plus omega plus one is equal to zero assuming omega is not equal to one or, or omega is equal to 1 is also a perfectly valid uh, root of unity. Now, there are a few properties of this root of unity. So, like I said, that omega is a third root of unity. You can generalize omega being an mth root of unity. Okay? So, basically, if omega is an mth root of unity, then that implies that uh, it is a root of the polynomial f of x is equal to x's power 
m minus 1 and the reason for that is this x is for m minus 1 can be easily factorized as x minus 1 times 1 plus x plus x square this goes all the way up to x is for m minus 1 right so either like i said before either omega can be equal to 1 or if omega is not equal to 1 then we would have 1 plus omega plus omega square all the way up to omega is for m minus 1 is equal to 0 we've already seen the case where m is equal to 3 x cube minus 1 the third root of unity we've already seen in that case 1 plus omega plus omega square will be equal to 0 right so this is essentially property number one property number two is um, if omega is an mth root of unity let me just write that so if essentially if omega is an nth root of unity then that implies uh, omega raised to the power a is equal to omega raised to the power b. This actually implies that a is congruent to b modulo m, right? So omega is let's just say omega is an mth root of unity, right? And if omega raised to the power a is equal to omega raised to the power b, so let's say for example, for example, omega raised to the power eight is equal to omega square, then that implies uh, eight is congruent to two modulo three, where omega is let's say the third root of unity, right? In this in this particular case. And this is true, and this is true, and this is applicable both ways, right? It's vice versa. Now, I'm just going to give you like a small proof for this. So, like I said, the assumption was that omega raised to power a is equal to omega raised to power b. That implies that omega raised to power a minus b is equal to 1. Well, that um, essentially implies that omega raised to power a minus b is equal to omega raised to power m. Because again, if omega is an mth root of unity, omega raised to power m will be equal to 1. If omega is the third root of unity, omega cube will be one. You can think of it that way, right? Okay, great. Now, what does this mean by laws of exponents? I can just write that a minus b is equal to m, or in other words, a minus b will congruent to zero modulo m, right? Because the remainder will be zero. And that implies that a is congruent to b modulo m. And that is our claim proven, right? Quite interesting. So like I said before, like I gave you the example, if omega is a third root of unity right third root of unity then that would imply that omega is for 8 is equal to omega square because 8 is congruent to 2 modulo 3 I think this is a pretty good example for uh, for what we're talking about okay another thing property number three that I like to like to mention is there exists like a closed form for omega. So if omega is an mth root of unity, then it does exist a closed form for this. And this is actually equal to e raised power 2 pi i by m times k, where k is essentially an integer, right? k belongs to 0, 1, 2, all the way up till m minus 1. We'll consider it like a whole number, you know, up to m minus 1. So that's like a closed form for this omega. Okay, so those are three things that you should know about roots of unity. And now let's just get right into this problem. So again, just to remind you, n raised to power 8 plus n plus 1, this needs to be a prime. And like I said, my kind of intuition is going to be, if I can just factor this into two distinct pairs, two distinct factor pairs such that both of them are greater than 1, that essentially would mean that n raised to power 8 plus n plus 1 will be composite. It will never be prime. It will have two factors. And that is essentially going to be my core of my argument. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let f of x be equal to x is power 8 plus x plus 1 similar to what we have in the problem and i'm gonna say that omega is a third root of unity right so essentially omega is third root of unity what does this essentially mean that essentially means that omega is equal to e to the power 2 pi i by 3 or i can just state that um, omega square plus omega plus 1 is equal to 0 and like we said before, omega raised to the power 8 is equal to omega squared, right? As 8 is congruent to 2 modulo 3. And omega is a third root of unity, right? So basically, omega raised to the power 8 is equal to omega squared. Now, can I just use that over here, right? So basically, basically, f of x is x raised to the power 8 plus x plus 1. Well, f of omega would be omega raised to the power 8 plus omega plus 1. But omega raised to the power 8 is nothing but omega square, right? This becomes omega square plus omega plus 1, which is 0, right? From this, because omega is a third root of unity. So therefore, omega is essentially a root of essentially f of x, right? You can just put it that way. And f of x is needless to say, 
x is for 8 plus x plus 1. And also notice that omega is also a root of x square plus x plus 1. Right? So if I define, let's say, a polynomial g of x as x square plus x plus 1, that essentially implies that g of omega will be omega square plus omega plus 1, which is 0. So therefore, omega is also root of this g of x. But what does that mean? That means that f of x, which is x square x is per 8 plus x plus 1, is equal to g of x, x square plus x plus 1, times some other polynomial. Let's call that, let's say, r of x. Right? So that essentially means that x squared plus x plus 1 is a factor of x to the power 8 plus x plus 1. And kind of the core objective behind that is that omega is a root of this and omega is also a root of this, such that omega is the third root of unity. And because it's a root of both these things, we can essentially write this. Right? And how do we find r of x? It's just, you know, simple polynomial division. You can try this out yourself. Basically, divide these two quantities. And I've done this before, so you can um, just note down the statement. You can try it on your own. R of x is essentially x is per 6 minus x is per 5 plus x cubed minus x squared plus 1. So very nice pattern sort of it is forming, right? So basically, our core result is x is per 8 plus x plus 1 is equal to x squared plus x plus 1 times x is per 6 minus x is per 5 plus x cubed minus x squared plus 1. That's amazing. And I'll, I'll let you go back to something that I said before. I'd said before that if we can factorize this into two distinct terms, such that both of them are greater than 1, my work is done. It will never be a prime. It will always be composite. Now, f of x was x is for 8 plus x plus 1, right? So I'll be f of 1, it'll be 1 plus 1 plus 1. So f of 1 is equal to 3, which is a prime. Right, f of 1 is equal to 3, which is a prime. Now, for all n greater than 1, for all n greater than 1, do you agree that n raised power 8 is greater than n square? I think it's very obvious because exponential function is always increasing. Right, and the higher the exponent, the more higher the value is, provided that the base or n in this case is greater than 1. Right, so n raised power 8 will always be greater than n square for any, any integer or any natural number n greater than 1. So n raised power 8 is greater than n square. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add an n plus 1 on both sides. Right? So that essentially means that n raised power 8 plus n plus 1 is greater than n square plus n plus 1 for all n greater than 1. Well, what does that mean? That means that this thing is greater than 1 for all x greater than 1. That means that this thing is also greater than 1. You know, just from what I said over here, both of these things are greater than 1, right? So this thing is greater than 1, this thing is greater than 1, essentially implies that this is also greater than 1. What does that mean? That essentially means that this thing, x to the power 8 plus x plus 1, is uniquely factorized into two quantities. And when any number or any polynomial is uniquely factorizable into two such quantities, then it can never be a prime. Right? Because essentially any prime number, for example, 7 is essentially 7 times 1. For example, um, any, any, any prime number, for example, 5, it is 5 times 1. Right? 19, it is 19 times 1. Essentially, it can only be factored into like two, two possible scenarios. The first thing is 1 and the second thing is the number itself. I right? look at any prime, any prime p is nothing but the prime p times 1. That is the only possible way to factorize it. It's, it's non-factorizable essentially. It's just a prime p. Right, you can multiply it by one as many times as you want, but the fact of the matter is that you can never have a scenario like this where it is uniquely factorized into two terms such that both of them are greater than one. So what does that mean? That means that x to the power 8 plus x plus 1 is composite for all x greater than 1. Right? Because again, like I said, this assumption was for n greater than 1. So n raised to the power 8 plus n plus 1 is never prime for all n greater than 1. So therefore, the only possible scenario is when n is equal to 1. It can happen. And just to remind you, we had n raised power 8 plus n plus 1. If you just plug in n is equal to 1 over here, you get 3, which is a prime. Therefore, our only solution is n is equal to 1. So quite a fascinating thing, right? So essentially, what I had told in the beginning, um, that was true. 
we had to in a way just somehow factorize this into uh you know two of its factor pairs right this this thing n is for 8 plus n plus 1 now the tricky part was that factorizing it wasn't something that was very standard to do right we look at standard factorizations there are few techniques and you can just play around with them and some of the other time you will just be able to factorize them but here we had to use complex numbers in order to factorize this and this is actually very uh, very fascinating that uh, n raised power 8 plus n plus 1 actually is perfectly divisible by n square plus n plus 1 and the reason for that is complex numbers and that's just the beauty of complex numbers it can really make your life a lot better you know even though the name is complex but uh, it actually like you see helped us really well in this problem because we essentially used just a simple idea that if a number is prime it can never have two distinct factors such that both of them are greater than 1 it was as simple as that and then our entire procedure our entire goal of whatever we did was in order to find those two factors what they were so we just found that n is for 8 plus n plus 1 and n square plus n plus 1 share a common root and that common root was omega the third root of unity right and therefore when you divide each other you'll get a perfectly rational uh, perfectly rational number so i really hope you like that and learn something from it it was quite an interesting question of uh, more than more complex numbers actually than number theory so i hope you enjoyed that okay so moving on to some book sessions for national math olympiads we have elementary number theory by david burton problem solving strategies by arthur and jell functional equation by venkata chala problems in plane geometry by sharigin elementary number theory by sipinski graph theory by harari and combinatorix by brualdi okay so at the end we have a similar but challenging problem and i wanted to find all real numbers of this given form that can be represented as a linear combination of the roots of unity with rational coefficients where p and q are primes so not necessarily distinct so p and q may be equal and a greater than 1 is an integer which is not a qth power quite a fascinating question quite a few um assumptions involved like a is not a qth power p and q are not necessarily distinct you know linear combination of roots of unity so when you try this out it's a very very interesting problem actually and if you're able to do it let me know until then i'll see you in the next video thank you very much and bye bye the programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics and they are personalized with one on one training individual evaluation and remedial sessions the reason chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real olympians from leading universities in india united states and europe some of our students come back to teach at chinta from oxford cambridge harvard mit ucla isi cmi iits tifr and iisc for more information visit chinta.com